Hello, and welcome to the latest in the PDA Society's series of webinars run in partnership with leading professionals in the field. Today, we're delighted to have Alison Hart from Children's Choice Therapy Service with us, who is going to talk about PDA and sensory processing. Following her presentation, which will last about 40 minutes, there will be a question and answer session along with one of the PDA Society's trustees for another half an hour or so. Please do ask questions at any time during the webinar by typing in the box under your screen and we'll go through as many as possible at the end. Just a few practical points first. If you have any difficulties with viewing the webinar, please try to make sure that you have a good broadband connection, 4G or Wi-Fi, and if you're using home Wi-Fi, make sure that no other devices are connected at the same time. You could try using a different web browser, such as Internet Explorer instead of Chrome, or click the Alternative Stream button under the main window. And please also remember that a recording of the webinar will also be available to watch on demand within 24 hours. I'd now like to introduce Alison Hart. Alison is the Director of Children's Choice Therapy Service, a special, specialist group of occupational therapists with sensory integration accreditation who provide occupational therapy assessment, treatment and training. Alison qualified as an OT in 1993, working across a spectrum of acute and community services specialising in neurology. In 2000, Alison transferred to paediatrics and then into NHS management of clinical services. In 2009, Alison left the NHS to begin independent practice to return to more clinical interventions and thorough assessment specialising in sensory processing and full OT interventions improving functional outcomes. Alison also lectures at the University of Derby. Now, over to you, Alison. Thank you, Vicky. So, hello and welcome to this webinar considering sensory processing disorders in the complexity of the individuals we live and work with with PDA. As I'm sure you're aware, as yet we do not have a wealth of credible research considering the links between SPD, sensory processing disorder, and PDA, although experience and anecdotal evidence is clearly growing through practice. Currently in the UK, sensory processing disorder is recognised through diagnostic criteria in relation to autism spectrum disorders, but with little clarity in other areas, which is stopping it being commissioned within the NHS. However, as an independent group, um, education, health and social care fully interact and request understanding of how sensory processing is impacting a child's behaviours, abilities to engage and learn and everyday activities. So we know that we are on the right track. So this session is designed to consider what are sensory processing disorders and how does this link to our understanding of a pathological demand avoidance. I'm going to give some teaching around what the senses are and how our interpretation of these impact function with the overall aim that we can have an increased understanding in how it impacts these children, young people, and through into adulthood. So we're going to have a consideration, first of all, of what is sensory processing disorders and how does PDA fit in. Sensory processing is our ability to understand and organise sensory feedback for function. In the 1960s and 70s, Jean Ayres, an occupational therapist and clinical psychologist in the States, was working with children and young people, looking at motor coordination, behaviours, emotional regulation, and still wondering what that barrier was to engaging in everyday activities. And it was here that she established a theory of sensory integration, part of our neurological understanding. She understood that we needed to understand how our bodies worked and how sounds, sights, smells and tastes all came together to help us be able to interact with our environment. It also recognises the way the nervous system receives these messages from the senses and turns them into appropriate motor and behavioural response. Sensory processing in itself is recognised through research to impact one in 20 children in daily life. And of those, one in six daily activities are actually impacted by sensory processing disorders, meaning that it stops them being able to tolerate clothes, eating foods they want to, go to bed as they need to, sleep, settle, engage in play, learning, and all of the recognised behaviours. But we know that sensory processing disorder has a broad spectrum of severity. I'm sure there's lots of you out there who would not like to be feeling the texture of velvet, or some people hate the touch of cotton wool, or the smell of petrols, or certain foods that just make you gag. And equally, we will work with children and young people who need two-to-one support, who can't tolerate environments, who will even do severities such as self-injurious behaviours and headbanging to try and help them manage everyday life. Sensory processing considers all those aspects. 
So what happens in sensory processing? We know that we need to lay down neural pathways. So every time we learn an activity, we lay down a neural pathway and we build on those skills. So when I first learned to sit and to crawl and to walk, my mum probably used chocolate buttons as a good motivator for me. But I would have felt what it was like to move, to crawl. I got the feeling of the weight through the arms and the legs, the balance that I needed to, until I got to the chocolate button that I wanted, popped it in my mouth, thought that tastes good, a good sensation, I'm going to do that again. If I was to get you to pick up something in your room, I advise you don't, and go and throw it at a target, please don't, especially if it's hard, and you miss, you could have another go. You'd know to change the force, not because you look at your arm and change the trajectory, but that you know how heavy it felt and what force you needed to do to do that. Um, so we need to gauge, engage in repetition and learning to lay down neural pathways for us to be able to carry out an, um, an activity effectively. The difficulty being is if, if we struggle to learn those um, early development goals, through poor sensory processing, then we can't build on those skills and develop effectively. And therefore it starts to impact our behaviours and through even to adulthood and our expectation of the environment. Where we have effective sensory processing, it impacts everything that we do. The choices that we make, the learning that we engage in, our engagement with other people, our social interaction, our behaviours and our functions. But when it doesn't work, equally it impacts those same things that we choose and want to do. So today I'm going to teach you a little bit of neurology. I don't know what ages you are out there. I'm not even going to ask because I won't get a response. Um, but I'm um, it's in the middle part of life and I'm okay with a computer, but I'm not great. My children are lots better. They can press buttons randomly and create amazing things. I'm not able to do that, but I can create okay programs and have managed to get onto this webinar today, so I'm feeling quite proud of myself. In many ways, our brain is like a computer. If you press the right buttons on your computer, then it is already pre-programmed to do certain things. It's what we call hierarchical development in the brain. So where we get the right in information in, the movements, the senses, and information from our environment, then our brain is able to organize that and produce effective function occupations and development. Occupations are the things we do every day, such as sleeping, eating, play, learning, etc. But if we are unable to process that information in the computer, if we can't organize all that information in order and put it in the right hier hierarchy, then it can end up very confused and impact the outcomes that we see. We know, similarly, that we demand avoidance Using social manipulation is seen in all children, which strongly contrasts with the features of autistic spectrum disorders. In sensory processing disorder, which we commonly see across autism and more recently across PDA, children will also avoid environments, activities and interactions that can feel challenging and overwhelming, trying to create a sense of safety and a sense of control within which they feel that they can manage. If we look at the work of George Timmons and think about pathological demand avoidance in terms of teaching, then we think about the anxieties, the teaching styles, the environments and the support that we need. But if we're thinking about anxiety, sensory processing goes further to say what is triggering my anxiety? What are those first foundational steps that are stopping me being able to tolerate this environment that I'm, being in, that I'm trying to work within? Am I ready? Am I in a position to be able to learn at this point, at this time, at this day? Am I able to understand this environment, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, and the proximity of others? And do people really understand me, the things that impact my everyday, the smells that make me feel like I want to gag, the proximity of people that are just overwhelming? And am I in a place that I'm actually able to learn and to engage and listen in the things that I need to do? Sensory processing sits beneath all of that. Sensory processing is the place that helps me coordinate in the morning, whether I know that I need a coffee before I start the day or a glass of wine. Sensory, process, not the start of the day, though. sensory processing will set me up for the day, set me up for being able to engage in things, and it will impact my behavioural presentation, and it defines who I am, who is me. At school, we have to do all things such as PE, sit and learn to task, engage with lots of people, queue up, eat the school dinners that are provided or sit in a noisy lunch hall. As adults, more and more we are able to choose and select the activities that we want to do. 
the things that we feel able to engage in that fit with our neurological processing, our sensory processing. And that's really important. So we're going to go through and consider what the senses are. Normally at this stage, I'd ask how many senses do you think we've got and get a variety of answers. Today we're going to address seven main senses, um, which is what we tend to work to in terms of sensory processing. <coughs> so the first sense is probably a new one to some of you, and it's called proprioception. Proprioception is our awareness of our body position in space. So all the way through your muscles, you've got like little springs. Um, if you remember your physics lessons at school, you may have hung weights on the bottom of a spring weight so that it would move and tell you exactly how heavy something is. In my mind, it's a little bit thinking like that, that there's little springs all the way through your muscle spindles, telling your nervous system to send messages to the brain how much stretch or um, contraction there is on your muscles, how much force is going through them. We also have Golgi tendon organs, which sit within our joints and receptors and where muscles, tendons and ligaments meet bone, etc. And they tell us the forces. So exactly right now, presuming most of you are sitting down, you'll know how heavy you're sat on the chair, or if I dare be a little bit rude and forward, which cheek of your buttock is heaviest on the chair. You will know where your left foot is, your left big toe, without having to look down and see where it is. If you close your eyes and touch your nose, chances are that your finger will land on the end of your nose successfully. You have this awareness of where your body position is in space, and that's essential for everything that we do, everything that we engage in. It is essential for me to sit on my chair or for me to get up and walk around, to feed myself, to settle to sleep. Predominantly, a lot of people we're considering today will find that really hard to understand and to organise that sense, and will be seeking out more proprioceptive input. That's usually through hand flapping, door slamming, stomping feet, hiding in small places, pushing up against people, squeezy hugs, head banging, running round and round, um, or running up and down the stairs. Anything that gives increased pressure and forces through our joints and muscles informs our proprioceptive system, telling us um, where our body position is in space. This has to work with our tactile system our touch system, which is one you will recognise from memory from school. But our touch system is very, very emotive. I've been married for 24 years, and I love my husband very much, but he still cannot seem to work out when to give me a cuddle and when he needs to keep his distance. I'm not sure why he finds that hard, but it seems to be an ongoing problem. We're very careful about when we want to be touched and on what terms we want to be touched. If you're able to, and especially if you're sat with somebody else in the room, then just to touch the hairs on their arm could be quite a good way to explore this. Just by touching just the hairs on your arm, a lot of people will then rub really hard on their arm because that feeling is uncertain and unclear and even quite tickly, and a few people will really like it. Our tactile scent uses lots of different layers through the epithelium, through the skin, telling us whether something was smooth or hard, deep pressure, or whether it was light touch. Hair root plexus, which if you touch the hairs on your arm, are just a light touch, are pretty useless. They tell us about proximity, they tell us about presence of clothing, and those kind of things, but they don't tell us much detail. We rely on our nerve endings to tell us mostly about what something feels like and whether we like the touch and feel of that. Tactile discs, corpuscles of touch, and other methods will tell us if it was deep touch or whether it was light touch. This presents us with some obvious problems. If you don't like that tickly feeling of your hair root plexus being fired off, but presumably most of you or all of you are sat wearing clothes and moving around in the day, you'll be constantly firing that off. But if you're constantly thinking about that tickly sensation or where the label is in your clothing or the seams in your socks, then it's very hard to concentrate and engage in what you're doing. But for those of us who are able to sense your process, we have this great neural ability to park information that we're not interested in. So even if I put on an item of clothing that seems quite tickly, or has an irritable label, I can often ignore that for most of the day. I can park that information. With having different layers of touch, if I'm stood in a queue and somebody brushes past me, if I'm not aware and not organising and not thinking about what's happening, it can be hard to work out if that was a gentle touch or whether somebody was being quite aggressive towards me, in which case, um, you know, I can respond inappropriately. Someone might have just brushed by me in the dinner queue, but I thought that was quite violent, so I might take a them back at them in return, thinking they were being aggressive. Our greatest area of touch receptors for density is in our mouth region, in our oral. 
less than an atom, 25% more touch receptors in our oral area than anywhere else, so we understand. It's also the first sense to develop within the womb. This means that um, often we prefer to put things in our mouth because it gives us greater understanding, um, greater understanding of what uh, something feels like and what that texture's like. But that can also create problems further on when we think about foods, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So we're thinking about our body position in space, our proprioception, and that need for more force often, and understanding. And we're thinking about our touch sense <clears throat> and how emotive that can be, trying to organize all those different textures around us and things that touch us and we come in contact with. We have one more internal sense. These three are what we call our somatosensory system, our internal regulation. And we're thinking about the vestibular sense, which is our balance and our position against gravity. So within our inner ear, in a simplistic description of it, we have little hairs called the otoliths that sit in a substance called the macula. And as I tilt my head, the macula moves, the hairs lean over, and they inform my nervous system directly to my brain, telling me what position my head is in. If I go up against gravity, all of that density of that substance changes, and for some people we can get that feeling of vertigo, feeling quite dizzy. If I spun you round and round and round on the spot, again, I don't advise you necessarily to do it this morning, but if I spin you round and round, then you'll get this sense of dizziness. And exaggeration, but it's like the macula, the substance going round and round like a plug hole, not being able to inform your brain of whether you're upside down, the right way up, or whatever. So you have to rely on those senses of body position awareness, touch, <clears throat> and movement to try and coordinate your balance and, and regain your balance within space. Our vestibular system same as the others, all have to work together. So if I got you now to stand on one leg and then got you to stand on one leg with your eyes closed, there would be very different tasks. If you've had vision, if you understand your body position in space, you understand touch and you understand balance, then you're able to coordinate that movement in line with your other senses. If we take away one of those senses, such as vision, suddenly it all feels very different. So our sensory processing when we're feeling tired or when we're feeling unwell will massively be impacted and can change how well we can present ourselves. So there are three internal senses, our touch, our body position awareness, and our balance and position against gravity. But we also have the senses that you may well be more familiar with, such as sound. Sound is a massive issue for a lot of the people that we work with, not because they've got hearing disabilities um, or impairments, but just often because they're having to concentrate so hard on, for example, sitting on a chair, working out their body position, making sure there's enough stimulation to know where it is so they don't fall off, managing that balance, proximity of others, temperature, pain, clothing, what they're holding, what they need to do, that suddenly external stimuli can very quickly be overwhelming. If I'm studying really hard in my office and not concentrating and one of my children was to come up behind me, they'll usually make me jump not because I've had hearing difficulties, but because I was engaged so much in something else. And it can often be similar to that. Equally, we have auditory discrimination difficulties. And this is where I find it very difficult to block out sounds. So I've already confessed I'm well into my middle age, and I prefer to have friends around at home, because I can hear them. Sitting in a pub, I'm the one going, pardon, what did you say? Can you just say that again? And so it gets harder and harder to be able to block out background noises. A lot of our people we work with will work on an on and off system. I'm either listening to all of the sounds in this room or I'm switching off and listening to none, which can make it very hard in the classroom when we're given instructions. We think we know what we've got to do, so we engage in our learning, but people are calling us and we're not responding. Or we're trying to concentrate on the telly so hard and block out background noises that it's hard then when mum's calling us for tea or whatever to be able to recognise those, those sounds. So auditory discrimination in its own right can be difficult. The one we often neglect is our olfactory sense, our smell. Our sense of smell links directly to our memories. Reportedly, we can hold up to 10,000 memories uh, related to smell. I'm not sure I hold 10,000 memories of anything, let alone related to smell. But my dad and my grandfather did have a lovely ironmonger's and hardware store. Um, there's very few left in the UK now, but there is one in Pitlockry in Scotland. And on holiday one year, I walked in and stood on the map and had all those smells come back to me with all these sort of flashing memories coming by. And I'm sure you will have experienced it, giving someone a hug and recognising it was grandma's perfume, or all those kind of comforting smells around baking bread and frying bacon. Um, there is a, a story that goes that two lads were playing snooker in a snooker hall and they had a fight, 
and one guy got the snooker hall and shoved it quickly up his mate's nose and gave it a shove and gave it amnesia because right behind our nasal cavity is where our memory bulb sits, where we our brain parts holds all those long-term memories. Smells can easily be overwhelming, and in children particularly, for those who have been in reception class and know that the jumper's been lost, somebody will hold it up and say, whose jumper's this? Or the children will come and smell it and say, oh, it's Daisy's jumper. Um, they can recognise the smells that clearly. So when we're going in the entrance of Debenhams and all the perfumes are going, or when the lady um, that we happen to be stood next to in the pharmacy probably could have had a better shower that morning, that's often why people will, our children will often embarrass in such a way and shout out, why do they smell? It's very hard to be able to regulate and to block out those smells if they get in your way. I remember teaching some special teachers up in the north um, and they were talking about their classroom, talking about the smells of disinfectant and wee and other such smells and shaving foam and paints. And they said, it's all right, we can ignore it when we get in there. And we do. It's one of those senses we very quickly park, as we talked about earlier, that information where smells can be overwhelming and mean we can't concentrate or engage in things that we need to do. Another sense that we often take for granted is that of our vision. So in terms of sensory processing, we're thinking about visual perceptual skills. Can we see something that's yellow on a yellow background surface? Can we see a step in the flooring? Can we see that the floor is sloping? Can we manage spatial awareness? Can we fill in the gaps and see what we need to see? Can we isolate the teacher from that really busy wall of all amazing displays and learning programs that are behind him or her? So visual perceptual skills are something that we take for granted, as I say, but they do massively impact if you did the task earlier of standing on one leg for balance and then closing your eye, you'll see how much you rely on your visual sense for what you do. If, for example, I ask you how many, elephant, how many legs this elephant has and give you a moment to consider that, many of you will say that that makes you feel quite weird, that you find it quite hard to work that out, but it's just dots on your computer screen. If I was to show you just a trunk and a big ear or a tusk, you would know immediately, immediately that it's an elephant. We don't look at everything fully. We fill in lots of the gaps in the way that we look at things. But a lot of our children, particularly that we're working with, and others with sensory processing disorders, have to really concentrate and engage to understand the whole context of what it is they're looking at. This picture is taken in a place called the Puzzle Room in Keswick. If you go to Keswick, I firmly recommend it as a holiday destination, and go down this side street and find the Puzzle um, Museum. This gentleman is standing upright, but the room is angled at 45 degrees. My in-laws live near there, so I go there quite regularly. I know, because from early on, I learned how to crawl and I learned how to walk. I know proprioceptively how my body works, how it walks along horizontal floors, alongside vertical walls. I've got all that orientation and my visual perceptual skills of what a room looks like. When I go into this room, as you can just see in the picture, I can roll a snooker ball on the snooker table and it rolls uphill. I know it doesn't roll uphill. I know the room is angled at 45 degrees. But it feels, to all extent and purposes, that I am rolling the ball up the hill. On the other side of the room, great for an occupational therapist, is a stanner type stair lift. And I sit on it and it rolls me up the stairs. I know it isn't rolling me up the stairs. It's just because the room is built on 45 degrees that the walls are at 45 degrees and the floor is as well. In that room, I can't walk. I stumble around, the same as you might have done in the old ghost houses in the fairs, where you can see the floor is uneven, but you can't adjust all that proprioception in your vision. Just outside of this room in Keswick, there's usually a bucket for people to be sick in when they need it to be there. I'm just trying to get over the point that if we have good visual skills, we very much rely on them to organise our proprioceptive sense, our body position awareness, our vestibular sense, our balance and position against gravity, our tactile and our other senses. And we rely on those. Being in that room makes me feel a little bit what it must be like to have some kind of sensory processing disorders, where things just don't work and come together like, like they need to. Just by changing one of our senses slightly in that room, suddenly I'm unable to walk, I'm unable to organise my body, it feels out of kilter, and it feels really, really awkward. Okay, another one that we want to think about is taste, because often one of the things that we do have control of is what we put in our bodies, what comes out the other end, and when we sleep. So taste, again, can be really emotive. 
We know we have taste receptors um, in our tongue and in parts of our mouth which will understand the messages. We have lots of different food groups, sweet, sour, bitter, salt. Personally, I like uh, savoury and sweet and anything really and everything that I can and I'm allowed to eat. But as we talked about earlier briefly, it's not just about distinguishing what those tastes are and having that real trying understanding everything that we need to do with sensory processing disorders, but it's about understanding the textures of foods. And we'll often lose children around that early stage of coming off the pureed diet onto the mixed diet where we've got lumps and smoothie textures mixed together because they're very hard to organise. We know a lot of our children and adults prefer to eat the pasta first. Because if I eat the pasta, I've worked out what that texture's like, I know what it's going to feel like, I've got that sorted. Now I'm going to move on to the sausage, because I can work out what that texture's going to be like, I'll do that one next, and then I'll move on to the peas or whatever. To eat those textures and food separately is a lot easier for me to understand. Therefore, dare I say swear words like yogurt with bits in, or mashed potato with bits in, um, are really hard to distinguish and work out within our mouths and feel really uncomfortable because we don't have that same kind of pleasure. It's important to say at this stage as well, where children have sensory-based eating disorders, that if they find it very difficult to sit to a table, to sit to a chair, they find the smells very difficult to organise, they find all that balance and holding cutlery and managing all that information very difficult because these will in fact impact our motor skills. We don't have feelings of hunger inside us because our proprioception system says we want more input and we don't understand that need of what the tastes feel like and textures can feel very disorganized, then we're not going to want to eat. So great theories of let's leave them for a couple of days and then they'll eat anything you put in front of them. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in terms of sensory processing disorders. So there's a whole ethos of things that we need to think about, even when we're just thinking about the food that we present. If I have a crunchy roast potato in front of me, I can touch it with my fingers and know it's hard <coughs> Excuse me, and crunchy. But when I put it into my mouth, suddenly I've got some mush with some hard bits in there. And that isn't what I bargained for. So we've gone very quickly through those seven senses, thinking about our body position, our position against uh, gravity and our balance, and our touch systems, and how they all need to work together for me to be able to organise my body. If I'm engaging in those, then all those environmental senses, things that come at me from the external environment, can be equally hard for me to organise. And they have to be organised together. I can't process taste, and then vision, and then body position. They have to work together for me able to engage in everyday activities. So what happens with that information? The information comes up our peripheral nervous system. That's like our electrical wiring all over our body, our arms and our legs. And it comes, brings that sensory stimulation from those senses that we've talked about, sending messages up to the central nervous system, which will then organise the information and tell our body what to do. So if you've got an itch right now, your hand will automatically come up and just give it a scratch. If your hair's in your face, you'll just come up and brush it out the way. If you're sitting uncomfortably, you will just adjust. You don't need to think and process those conscious decisions. The central nervous system will function to coordinate all of that information that's coming in. And it consists of the brain and the top part of the spinal cord. It works with the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, sending those messages back and forth. Overriding that, we also have our autonomic nervous system, which for any education staff out there, I hate to swear again, but it's a bit like the offset of our nervous system. It oversees our nervous system, making sure that it's working as it should. We have two parts, and they're worth thinking about in terms of sensory processing. We have our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight. It's the part that I have control of. Am I going to stop in this situation? Can I do this? You have the physical signs, like the increase in blood pressure and heart rate, the butterflies in the stomach, because our GI tract, our digestion system, is the only organ that can survive without blood oxygen, so the blood gets taken other places, hence the feeling of butterflies in our stomach. And if we can't reboot our computer, then the parasympathetic nervous system takes it over which is very much like a shutdown. Any shutdowns or blackouts should obviously seek proper medical information to ensure that there's nothing else happening. But it is quite usual for us to have that reboot of our system, a little bit like our computer analogy, when it freezes and we all press the off button to hold it down and to reboot the system. And that's what our parasympathetic nervous system will do. It keeps us safe. It stops us strangling ourselves 
holding our head own head underwater. It stops us holding our breath for too long. It will just help us to faint and pass out when we're not able to cope. It helps the, neuro, the neurological system, in a way, untangle itself and reboot. Because all day long, our nervous system is trying to organise this information that we're talking about today. If we think about the sensory intake and we think about a fire, if you could smell, I hope you can't, I hope you can, if you can smell smoke, hear crackling, see flames and feel really hot, then your response would be to get up and run out and fire the, phone the fire brigade and check that you're as far away and in safety as you need to. If you're too hot, you'll take your cardigan off. If you've got an itch, you'll scratch it. If you're uncomfortable in bed, you'll change your position and re-regulate. This process has to happen 24-7. Our brain is too busy to be thinking about it, so it needs to happen in the lower part of the brain to be organised. So let's just quickly think about how that actually impacts the presentation of behaviours that we often see. The information that comes through the peripheral nervous system to our central nervous system comes into our brain, and we're going to briefly think about it in terms of the triune brain and the hierarchy. So as the information comes in, it first comes to the primitive part of the brain. That's your fight and flight, your defense, your walking, your sleeping. Things that you don't need to think about, just organizing. It should be organizing most of your sensory processing as we are speaking so that you don't need to keep regulating. If the reptilian part of the brain is unable to organize something for the body, a hierarchy goes to the next part of the brain, which is the emotional part. Do I want to do this? Do I like this? Does it feel good? Is it pleasant? And if we still can't process information, it goes to the next level, which is the neocortex, which is your conscious processing, the clever part of the computer that does the decision-making and the new learning. The problem is, if sensory processing can't happen in that reptilian part, that lower part of the brain, we end up with a traffic jam or a car crash. And that's between, meaning that the brain doesn't get the information properly, and the car crash is between my fight and flight and my emotional part of the brain. I presume I don't need to tell you what that looks like, but it's really not very pretty. It's what we technically call an outburst or a meltdown. Not a temper tantrum, but it's where the fight and flight, the defense and the limbic part of the brain take over. It's the outburst that unfortunately as parents and carers, we can't impact. It means that we can't say calm down or let's go over here or that's not very rational or you shouldn't have spoken to me like that. Because every time we talk and communicate, we are just throwing another car into that car crash. If we think back to the computer analogy of our nervous system, it's like pressing lots of different buttons when your computer's frozen. frozen. And we all think that we might just press the right button that's suddenly going to make my computer carry on and not lose, potentially lose the saved work that I had. But what has to happen, as with my computer, I am going to have to press the off button and hold it down. It does need to reboot. It's the only way that it's going to organize. So we have to let that calm down happen before we can engage and look at behavioral response. We have lots of different types of sensory processing disorders. We have sensory registration where we often miss a lot of the sensory cues around us. We don't register that information correctly. We have sensory modulation disorder, which you will see lots about on the internet. Not all correct, but lots out there. The idea that I can't get enough and the right levels of sensory input. So I will seek more stimulation or I will avoid lots of stimulation. So, it's diffi um, so it means that I don't get the right level of stimulation I'm often seeking or avoiding or trying to get away from things. Sensory discrimination disorder is where I find it hard to discriminate maybe the types of touch or the smells that I've experienced. And all of these can impact our motor response. If I can't organize my body position well, then how am I going to be able to present as unclumsy or manage some sports. If I don't have good tactile understanding from my hands, how can I hold a knife in one hand and a fork in the other and watch them both to help them move? Alongside that as well, we also have the understanding of our sensory threshold. So you and I will all have a sensory threshold of what we tend to work in, how we manage. On a Monday morning, mine's quite low. Hopefully at this point on Tuesday, it's a little bit higher and I'm more alert and engaging more effectively. But that's impacted massively by the things that I do. My husband says that my sensory threshold changes for a few days every month. No idea what he's talking about. Whether I'm tired, whether I'm anxious about something, whether I'm unsure of my environment, or what's going to happen. So when we think about the individual with PDA and think of all the um, social anxieties around that environment and the impacts of 
being in those environments and the expectations on me to perform, again, that's going to massively change those thresholds and how I'm able to sensory regulate. So this is going to impact future development. First of all, our neurons are born and we lay down those neural pathways. And they, we learn our movement patterns, we learn our sensory patterns, and we learn our behavioural patterns. And we like to feel in control of them. We like to know they're going to work with environments. They will elaborate, they will develop as we learn new skills. And we get these highly specific connections between neurons, our synapses, which are just your electrical wiring, the nervous system. But depending on how much we engage, how repetitive we are in our learning, and how successful we are in our learning, can improve how do we develop. So we feel that working with individuals with PDA this is a massive stumbling block. That ability to want to engage, recognising those feelings of in change and wanting to build on those. In sensory processing, we are continually trying to get a balance across the nervous system, trying to calm and alert so that I can tolerate an environment and work appropriately within a situation. We're looking trying to get that balance across the nervous system but always, as occupational therapists, leading to function. I've been asked in schools, can you stop this child from flapping? Can you stop this child from wanting to fiddle? Is it a problem that they chew on their sensory chew all the while? If that's what we need to regulate, that's fine. I need a bar of chocolate every day to regulate. I need to get outside for a walk every day to regulate. The chocolate one people argue isn't true, but I'm sure it is. We have our own sensory ways of regulating, and they're really important to get our balance across the nervous system. So we need to think about adapting behaviours and supporting individuals with giving them what we call the just right challenge, the sensory input that they need to be able to develop and change ways of doing things, and tolerate different ways of doing things and build up their sensory motor uh, learning. So we'll use alerting and calming strategies to help maintain sensory regulation. These could be running around games that give more of that sensory input they're seeking or it could be calming activities which give more of the regulation. We'll use very rea clear, realistic expectations, making sure that we understand from thinking all the information we've discussed today, how that makes everyday activities hard, going out the door, being in a school environment, going to the shop, all, of, all that processing that needs to be done, how hard it can be. We'll use clear instructions and clear rules. I know you've had a webinar with speech and language therapy, thinking how often that we just try and remove as much verbal instruction and even go back to visual instructions, however articulate somebody can be to limit the additional processing. We try and identify signs, try and understand this sensory processing. This is why we freely go out there and work with parents and carers so that people can understand the kind of things that are likely to be triggered and likely to be hard to do. And certainly with our PDA group, we try to think very hard about strategies that they want to do. It can be very hard for them to do activities that make them feel different, make their balance systems, their touch systems feel different. So it's about finding ways in through parents and carers and everyday activities that are fun games that can give the stimulation that's required. And don't add to the processing. Don't think too much with verbal instructions and verbal communication. And think clearly about what somebody needs themselves to regulate and how long they can tolerate that for. So in sensory processing, we use things such as sensory diets. They're aimed to be proactive rather than reactive. We don't want to see a behaviour and then come swooping in with some fun sensory strategy or game as all we're doing is reinforcing that behaviour. So it's about trying ways through the day with our PDA community to give sensory, to give challenges, to give more proprioceptive input. Fun games like rolling in a blanket and pulling to unroll, swinging around on an office chair, if safe, I caution you out to do. Lycra, Lycra socks. Uh, like we're just from the market, made up into tunnels that can give nice, give firm uh, grip and cuddles without contact from somebody else. Having somewhere small space that I can go to and I can get away from it. Boxes of soothe things that I like that just give me lots of things to touch and feel or to smell that I can explore around. A sensory diet is so individual, there's no way that we can sort of go through all the aspects of that. But what I want you to take from this session is to think about all that information that needs to be processed. If we look at the individuals that we work and live with, we can often see where they're missing because they'll want to touch things or they'll avoid touching things. They'll be flapping or looking for more input. They'll get so much pleasure from slamming doors and deep pressure and throwing things or even hitting out and knowing that they want more proprioceptive input. Or they'll want to spin and spin and spin and maybe never get dizzy. 
that they need more vestibular input and creating games and activities that help give them some of that in a positive way that they're prepared to engage with. So I hope today has given you an opportunity just to think around all the impacts of sensory processing and start to look at why we see many of the behaviours that we do and how it can impact a lot of the PDA presentation and our ability to get out there and join activities. Any occupational therapist that you work with should be HCPC registered. That's most important and you can go onto the HCPC website to check accreditation of any staff. In the UK, our body for most of the training is a sensory integration network and our governing body is the Royal College of the Occupational Therapist. The sensoryprocessingdisorder.com in the States also links to a lot of research and good articles around sensory integration. There are also some references along with this presentation and some reading that you may want to go and have a think about. Thank you for listening today, um, and I'm here for a while for any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Alison. That was really fascinating and informative, and we hope that everybody found that very useful. Um, please remember that you can ask questions now um, at any time in the um, box underneath your screen. There are also links um, to many other resources in a box to the right-hand side of the screen with further information also available on uh, the PDA Society website and Children's Choice Therapy websites as well. So we're now going to move on to the Q&A session. And we're joined by Jane Sherwin. Hopefully you're there, Jane. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Jane. Uh, Hi, Jane is a trustee of the PDA Society, and many people will also know her as the author of the book, My, Ch My Daughter is Not Naughty. And she's a um, parent to a teenager with PDA. So um, we're going to look through um, some of the questions. So the first question that we have here is, um, can even mild sensory processing problems have big effects on behavior? So... Um, Alison, yes. can you touch on that? <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully by going through those senses, that sort of gives you an indication that even if my visual perceptual skills or I find touch quite threatening, just the fact that some textures or proximity to me is massively going to impact, therefore, how I might socially engage with somebody, how I might tolerate um, my own personal care, which again can impact then on social regulation. If you take something else, such as I'm just not very sure of my own balance system and position against gravity, even going upstairs in a house, or the threat of somebody might actually knock me and push me off balance, all of those little details can build up massively and make me feel uncomfortable, and therefore I might add to avoidance or other strategies that help me manage the environment that I'm in, escalating behaviours and such like. Great. Jane, anything that you can add to that from a sort of practical parent's perspective? Well, I'm just thinking, and Alison, I think she's perhaps covered it in the webinar, but I'll, I'll just ask to clarify. Can it appear, Alison, that a child may have mild sensory processing difficulties, but their fluctuating levels of anxiety will then in turn perhaps make that sensory processing more acute at different times? Absolutely. So that goes yeah. back to thinking about the threshold. So mm. sensory processing for a lot of the client group that we're talking about today doesn't mm. mean that they can't do it. It means that it's very, very, very difficult to do. So I have to be in a really good place. I have to get that balance across the nervous system, be in the right place of engagement, and motivated to want to do it. Any anxieties, tiredness, ill health, growth spurts, hormones, mm, definitely the hormones, will yeah. all change where my threshold is so you can suddenly see a massive increase in the presentation of SPD. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, th I think sometimes we can think it's mild, but then if the child's anxious, that sensory issues can suddenly come into play. If you just mm -hmm. excuse me for one second, please. What, what I must add into there as well is that often a lot of our children, when we think about children, can manage really well at school, and the teachers will say, oh, we don't see any problems here. Um, if we look under the desk, we can often see the troubles and the difficulties, but then obviously the children will come out of school like an absolute bottle of pop because they've been holding it in and trying to work within those social expectations and then let off because I need to reboot, I need all that information, I need to sort of re-regulate myself. That's a, that's a really good point, Alison. Yes, I've often likened my son to a shaken Coke can, yes. and I'm the one who has to pull pull the ring pull at the end of the day. Yes. Um, we've got a couple of questions here that relate to sleep and right. how um, sensory processing and disorder might impact on a child's sleep and whether there are any connections and links there if you could um, talk that through a little bit. Absolutely. So there's lots of reasons around sleep. We know that. There's a lots of um, you know, behavioural and habits that embed themselves around sleep as well. But we thought about the fact that when the sensory processing, the sensory information comes in, we have to organise that and respond. 
a lot of the people that we work with will predominantly want more of that sensory information and you'll see that through fidgeting, flapping, moving, touching, whatever through the day. It's very hard then to be, if you can't regulate, it's very hard to get your body in a position that you can settle for sleep. And even if you do, usually a few hours later, your nervous system is wanting more input. So often we'll wake up wanting to flap and move and whatever. And particularly for younger children then, if I'm partly awake, I might as well be wholly awake and just have all that input that I want. So we have massive difficulties around that. Often we'll use things such as passive stimulation for the nervous system to see if we can just get enough happening in the background. So things like white noise or using a fan as a trial, mm. um, particularly after the child's asleep, can feed the nervous system and tick it over, so can help. <clears throat> Ensuring there's enough stimulation through the night. So we'll use things like bolsters in the bed, rolling up sheets, blankets under the base sheets to make like a nest around the child. Because often if they're sensory seeking, they're the ones you'll find uh, in the morning that are sleeping between the mattress and the wall for more pressure. Sometimes moving the position of the sleeping child down the bed so that we've got a foot against a baseball or board or wall so that we can push against or again another boulder again can give more stimulation. We'll often think about weighted therapy, uh, which I'm sure you're aware should be mm. around about 10% of the child's weight um, and no more and they need to be able to move the weighted blanket if they want. But that's just going back to the days of sheets and blankets. A lined curtain or a big heavy bath towel does just the same job. Sleeping bags can give more input. And lycra sheets, so again, just using a piece of lycra that fits around the mattress, sewn down the underside so that I squeeze between the lycra and the mattress can give the same kind of input. Nice smells on curtains or bits of cloth in the bedroom as well can all give more stimulation. And where we're thinking of a child who's often seeking loads more sensory stimulation all through the day, as parents, what we often do then is calm them down for a good hour before bed. So when we turn that light off, they actually then need lots more input. So believe it or not, and I've got lots of parents that all give testimonials to say yes actually for those kind of children a good pillow fight before bed a bit of rough play some mm -hmm. deep pressure and all that mm -hmm. kind of input can actually be the best way to help them then settle because then they understand their body the best to settle down to sleep so yeah there is there is no end to the considerations we will give around sleep in terms of sensory processing but they do unfortunately play a massive part in stopping sleep routines okay that's brilliant thank you Alison there were some really really helpful mm -hmm. suggestions there which I hope everybody was able to catch um We've got a question um, here that relates to self-harm, um, and the question is, in terms of self-harm, cutting, etc., how much of this do you think could indicate a sensory need as opposed to it just being anxiety-based? Okay, yeah, so I don't have any the research to hand with me, unfortunately, but there is some really interesting research at the moment in our uh, mental health units looking at sensory processing strategies to help stop um, self-interest behaviours but also um, as a, a part cause to that. We know that when somebody has starts to self-harm in a considerable way, their sensory processing is not performing in the same way. They don't feel pain in the same way, so they increasingly want more intensity around that, certainly when we're looking at things like cutting, trying to seek that sensation. Um, so yeah, there's lots of um, research that's coming out around it, and we know it plays a part. It is a part, and though we're looking at sensory processing today, Certainly as an occupational therapist, it is just part of our toolkit. It has to be looked at alongside behavioural and lots of other approaches and certainly mm -hmm. thinking about self-harm, it must be considered as part of other strategies when working in that way. But yes, we know there is evidence to show that sensory processing, that seeking more, that trying to get a better understanding of my nervous system can be part of that self-harm cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm not I sure whether... Helped. Jane's back I am, with us. I, I am now back. You are? Okay. okay. I you think know. you might have something to add possibly on the on the self-harm side. Yeah, on the self-harm, I think definitely there is a, a sensory um, aspect there. And as Alison's just said, perhaps what can start as skin picking ceases to have the impact that it once did and you move on to the next level, which might be cutting with blades to get that same sensation. But from my experience as well, it's also very much linked to a child's mental health at any given yeah. time. And um, engaging in that self-harm as a way of releasing the turmoil that can sometimes be going on within the brain. Feelings of um, lack of self-worth, depression, spinning thoughts, and so on. That when you feel that bad about yourself, self-harming can sort of release all that confusion that's going on. Obviously, it's not a positive way to do it, and it is then really seeking some professional help in trying to address the, the triggers that are causing that for the child to engage in that in the first place to try and help them with, with how they feel about themselves and so on 
and also to perhaps try and find alternative ways to get that sensation that aren't as dangerous. Uh, and that may be, I know, advice that I've been given in the past is um, an elastic band, not an elastic band, uh, you know, a hair band on the wrist that you, yeah, you took on that, or holding crushed ice and what have you, so that you're getting that, that release, that sensation, but not in a way that's perhaps going to cause long-lasting scarring or the danger element of infections or nipping a vein or, or something like that. So it's, it may be sensory stuff rolled in as well with mental health at the same time. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Jane. Um, right, a, a practical question about socks here. So, uh, <laughs> my daughter struggles with getting dressed every day, particularly socks. I've lost count of the amount of money I've spent on different socks trying to find some that she will wear. Do you have any suggestions, please? Yep. So as I'm sure you're aware, if you've spent lots of money, you're probably thinking about seamless socks. Seamless socks are out there, unfortunately more expensive than they need to be. Um, it depends on the type of sensory processing disorder of what we'll do. Some of the children want more stimulation and prefer to not to wear socks at all. Often we'll use sports socks, so the toweling tight ones, but dried on your radiator rather than your tumble dryer, so they come out quite crunchy. Sometimes if you can find them, though we seem to be struggling to at the moment, insoles in the, in the shoes turned upside down so you get the bobbly side can also help do the socks to give some more stimulation when you're walking around, those kind of things. Thinking carefully about the size of the socks. A lot of the children actually prefer to have tighter socks so you don't have any sort of bits sticking out and whatever. You've just got to check circulation to make sure that you're not leaving any red marks and stuff after 20 minutes. Um, but it is more about stimulation. But a lot of it as well is thinking from this sensory processing that the children um, struggling to sleep through the night, struggling with all that regulation. Or like sometimes coming out of school, as we said, they've not had that stimulation through the night. They get up, they're having to go somewhere potentially they find quite difficult. They're having to clean their teeth, which is quite difficult often, get dressed and whatever before they've had a chance to sensory regulate. Even just putting some sensory activities in first, some time to run around on some different textures, using different massage on the feet, those kind of things to help alert the nervous system and help the nervous system understand what's happening a bit better can put the child in a lot better place before you start trying to put clothing, especially socks, which can feel quite difficult and uncomfortable. But it's an ongoing battle. There's no easy fix. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, um, if I just add to that, Vicky, it's yep. a difficult one. Um, we spent many years with no socks being worn at all. Even in winter, we would buy uh, boots that, that were fluffy inside. So she didn't need to wear the socks, but her feet were still warm. And I suppose you've got that... Um, that, that lovely feeling that she loved the feel of the fur inside the boots. Mm. As we did progress the socks, I just used to keep uh, purchasing lots of fresh socks because the discomfort would tend to come when they've been washed a few times and they get harder, don't they? Mm. And, but some children will prefer that harder texture because it gives them better yeah. understanding of the socks. It, yeah. it really is sort of a trial and error, really, of trying different mm. textures of socks and trying what, you know, what they want to do. And lots of grading, really. So if you are going for the no socks approach, when you do start introducing socks, it's just literally why you go and do something fun and then taking it off before they start to complain. Yeah. You know, if you've yeah. come in from somewhere and say, student socks off, everybody, great, let's have a run-around game, let's whatever, and, you know, rather than making it something that they've got to go, oh, these feel horrible and whatever, to keep drawing attention back mm. to it. So trying to use a bit of grading can be helpful. Thank you for that. Um, we've now got a question relating to um, changes during teenage years. Um, so my daughter has SPD dyspraxia and is currently being assessed for PDA. Becoming a teenager has made her symptoms so much worse. Is this an SPD thing? Um, it, it, it relates back to SPD because of the neurological system and how it develops. So as we go into teenage years, that's when we tend to get a lot more maturation of the nervous system um, and it starts to sort of reach its full potential. So therefore, where we've got gaps missing, where we've had problems through sensory processing, laying down those neural pathways, we start to often feel those gaps to a greater intensity. We also then naturally have the element where I'm trying to be more independent, I'm trying to fit in with my peers a lot more. So again, that exacerbates and highlights the sensory processing difficulties more. Um, and also difficulties around just um, hormones, and levels of those will change how my nervous system feels, how my body system feels, and as I said earlier, growth spurts as well. So I might get up the next day half an inch taller, and everything that I understood about my proprioceptive system, my vestibular system, doesn't feel quite as coordinated as I used to. 
and things that we used to find as regulation as children coming for more cuddles, more impact with people, more time down, we start to lose that as we go into teenage years and it seems the choice of what's a natural regulation activity such as rolling over the back of the settee um, can again, you know, we don't feel quite as able to do that or as willing or feel it's as socially acceptable for some. So we avoid those again so it exacerbates the presentation of sensory processing disorders. In terms of sensory seekers, often around age 15 to 16, the nervous system will suddenly take a flip. And where we were very active, wanting loads of that information, we can often become um, more sedentary, where we need more stimulation to alert and engage us. So yeah, what I'm basically trying to describe is that the sensory processing system can take massive changes through teenage years, depending on our situation, our age, our own development, and how good those neural pathways were laid down in the beginning. But you've got the dyspraxia again as well. The sensory feeds in, um, to in inform our motor learning. So if the motor learning isn't coming out as it should as well, it's not feeding good information back into the sensory processing system. So it all becomes quite a mismatch, which I guess your child's trying to organise now and alongside all those sort of hormone and regulation and independence learning of being a teenager. Thank you for that. That was very comprehensive. Jane, have you found any sort of... Um Anything in the change in in as not, as your daughter's grown from being very a younger child to a teenager from a sensory boy point? Yeah, very very interesting because um, Alison just explained it for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is really interesting. It's, we have the self awareness that kicks in, um, and so from a presentation point of view, it's it's more depression and isolation, you know, than than the explosions. But linked into the sensory profile, it has gone more from very, very much sensory seeking um, to not seeking out that regulation. And therefore, is she getting that stimulation that she needs because she's not doing the things, like Alison just said, that she would be doing as a four or a five-year-old? Mm. It's very much regressed and, and, and avoiding and protecting itself from the world so there will be lots of aspects where she perhaps needs that input and she's not getting it because you don't engage in the same sort of activities as you do when they're younger. So I'm going to have a think about that. Yeah, and it's not necessarily that they yeah. don't need it, it's just they become sedentary in it. So you need mm. to alert them. You know, they need a lot more before they alert. It's to do with where the threshold sits. Right, right. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. It does help to... Um, sort of answer some queries and also um, certain aspects of sensory processing seem to have become more acute with age. Yeah. I think it changes over time, like, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Well, ours does. If you sit me on a swing nowadays, yeah. I get that immediately that buzz in my tummy. Mm -hmm. It feels mm -hmm. quite scary as a child. That was never the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I feel that with the waltzers at the yeah. fairground. I used to love it, and now even the thought of going anywhere near them fills me with horror. So I can totally relate to that. Yeah, our nervous system is alive and continually changing through our lifespan. Right, we've got another very practical question here. Um, a 14-year-old PDA daughter compulsively running her hand and touching family members and school friends' short hair, which is inappropriate and drives her male cousins bonkers. She knows she shouldn't do it, but she doesn't seem to be able to help herself. Do you have any strategies or advice that you can help with this? So a 14-year-old inappropriately touching <laughs> short hair, um, do you have any, any suggestions? It does depend on the 14-year-old, and it's not an easy answer. Um, but, yeah, it, it usually comes from that I find that comforting. It helps me orientate usually my space, my distance from people. It gives me understanding of that text texture and it's usually then develops into something that I like. It helps me orientate how I am with that person, my space, my distance as I say and, and also my own textual awareness. The best way to do it really is to bring on board things like social stories around it and then to bring in a tactile program. So creating an own tactile box that has things in it that she can, uh, she? that we can well, touch well. and feel um, you know and so that I can get my own experience of different touch and things, so I'm replacing that need for the touch can be useful. Thinking about use of appropriate fidget toys, particularly when we know that we're going to see people like that, if it's a particular event or things that you're going to as well. But it does need to be alongside social stories, so you need to give something to replace the tactile system, and you need to give a strategy that's going to help learn that that's not appropriate to do that. Do you ever find it's helpful to talk to the child about sensory processing so they understand where that sort of drives yeah, so a lot of our teenage kids, 
older adults, yeah, we get end up in assessment, getting the flip charts out, drawing a person, going through each of those senses and getting them to identify because that's normally where we learn most of the things. We will use formal assessments such as the sensory profile and we have adolescent ones we can use, but actually just sitting on the floor with them with a flip chart can often open up most of the discussions and get them to understand a little bit about why they find those things difficult, that they don't see their peers and other members of the family finding difficult. And then, you know, certainly with PDA, that's great if they want to create some of their own strategies that they have control of. Okay, yeah. Another practical question here, uh, I think you'll both probably have quite a lot to say about this in terms of um, what, what are your recommendations when a child has moved into overload mode, i.e. defense and emotions have taken over. So at that kind of uh, meltdown point um, that we were talking about, what, what are your recommendations at that My stage? recommendations are to hide, really, to go away and hide. Um, <laughs> It really is the nervous system rebooting, and to go in and try and communicate in any way, you are not going to be effective. And I know as parents, if that escalation has come from inappropriate behaviour, then we really want to address that inappropriate behaviour. But you are never going to win a fight or an argument or a discussion at that point of reboot. Um, all you can do is make sure that the child is, is safe. Uh, that's not a satisfactory answer, but that is all that you can do safely. So what we recommend is that obviously you're going to look for triggers. Having things to hand downstairs in an environment such as a nice big furry blanket that the child can wrap themselves in or if you need to for safety that you can come from behind and safely wrap them in for firm and deep pressure to try and give some calming. Having a safe space downstairs which can be the bottom of a cupboard, a box or two foot behind the settee with a couple of cushions in with the idea that hopefully they will learn to take themselves off there and as soon as they remove themselves, cover their hood over, go into a blanket it means leave me alone, don't give me any more information. Whatever their behaviour's been or whatever they've said, don't give information. That's them trying to say, this is going wrong, I'm losing control, I'm trying to regain that control. So the sooner that they can show you any signs of that and you can back off, the better. I'm not saying don't discipline, but you have to do it after they've calmed down because they won't learn or process any information that you give them at that point in any way. So it is about trying to keep a safe environment, keep anything to hand that can help calm but best try and distract if you see any triggers or escalations coming in or if they start to go for any triggers um, or go for any recognition that they're losing control, i.e. walking away, putting themselves away, putting a hood over, hands over ears, then try and stop communication, stop any additional sensory processing to see if they can reboot first. But there's no magic pill that you can pop on the phrase. No. And Jane, anything to add to that? Yes, once you've got to the point of meltdown, I mean, I think Alison really covered most aspects of, you know, of really good ways to deal with it. Something, you know, an analogy that I try to use is it's about um, riding through the storm with them rather than trying to stop it. So if you think of a tidal wave coming, you jump on top of the tidal wave, you know, and ride it by their side rather than standing and trying to halt its progress because that's just going to make it stronger. Um, so like Alison said, it, it, it's a, for us it was a gradual learning curve. I would uh, um, illustrate the behaviour myself, that when I was stressed, I would say, I'm so stressed now, I'm going to go and lie on my bed and listen to some music to calm down. Hoping that I was demonstrating effective ways of dealing with situations when I got to overload that didn't involve um, completely melting down and trashing everything around me. We also found that allowing some expression, not going into panic mode when the first object was thrown, could allow some expression and it seemed to, the meltdown seemed to run out of steam sooner rather than later if we weren't trying to stop those initial stages. That initial burst of throwing a few items could sometimes be all that was needed for the regulation process to begin rather than it continuing escalating. So it really is looking at health and safety first, all of the people in danger, um, allowing some of the meltdown to flow uh, through intervals over time, showing how you deal with stressful situations so that they can learn themselves their own coping skills. Having that safe place to go to, which you don't invade. If they run to the bedroom, you don't follow them up and go in the room um, to try and tackle them over the behavior that's just happened. And then most importantly for me, was reflection. What had caused that situation to occur? What triggers had caused it to occur? Had I 
had an impact on it, had something that I'd done caused it, and then thinking of different ways around that situation in the future. And we gradually saw very violent meltdowns, slowly decrease to verbal ones, and then really for about four or five years now we've not had any violent meltdowns. We've got that process in place of running to a safe place and rebooting within that safe place. And in one of our first webinars, um, I think um, we cover um, a little bit about how to handle meltdowns in those yeah. as well. So there'll be, I'm um, sure you've covered all the points between the two of you, but um, that might just be a recap to, um, to listen to those again as well. Um, right, we're going to just try and squeeze in a last few questions. Um, I've got a question here about flashing lights and whether seeing flashing lights could be caused by sensory processing difficulties. So it's not, I don't think it's about the effect of flashing lights or fluorescent lights, um, but more whether seeing flashing lights might be a, a sensory processing issue. Alison, is that, have you got any thoughts on yes, that? It can be. All of those distorted, uh, those senses can present in a distorted way. Um, when we look at things like our engagement with vestibular sense, we're very heavily engaged in how we uh, use our eyes to regulate. We look for things like post-rotatory nystagmus, oscillation, all those kind of things of the eye movements. And often with sensory processing, we'll see a regulation of that. Um, and therefore, sometimes we can have some uh, neural tics and we can have some visual stimulation stuff that we see, such as the flashing lights, but obviously anything like that should be fully checked out carefully and made sure that all visual tests are done and any other neurological tests around that. But yes, we do have children reporting those kind of things that we relate back to sensory processing. Great, thank you. Um, a question here about um, a child who's shouting out a lot at school. Um, so my son is in mainstream school with a one-to-one, -one, but is constantly getting into trouble for shouting out. The school sees it as naughty behaviour and punishment is given out, such as stopping um, having to stay in at break time. Um, he's given extra warnings before the punishment is given, but it seems it has little effect. Do you have any suggestions? Um, might that be sensory related? Um, might that be a broader um, uh, ASD type difficulty? Um, any any suggestions? Yeah, it it might be either. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It can come from lots of different reasons. It can be a sensory processing. Usually it's around auditory discrimination. Mm -hmm. So we talked briefly about that, um, not being able to graduate and understand the level of background noises. And often we are the ones that are very loud then because I want to over, I need to, it's in my head there's lots of noises coming in so I need to be loud and be over those noises. Mm -hmm. And because I'm hearing lots of noises, I'm not really understanding that it actually is quite a quiet environment and people are taking their turn to talk. So it can come out that sort of auditory discriminatory type difficulty. Um, it's usually not just that. It usually does come alongside other ASD type presentations as well, um, as Vicky says. Um, what we will try and do is, though it sounds unlikely within your situation, but we'll work with the TAs um, and teachers in school really using question cards that they have priority to bring out those questions. Um, and we also do some playbacks of recordings sometimes. Um, to get us to see and explore how loud our voice can be. So even using phones, playing games, we're recording. Everybody says the same silly sentence that you've made up and to you is making the loudest noise. Um, we'll try and use uh, silly words that we just have as communication to say, oh, you're very loud, let's turn your volume down, or games like that, playing around volume switches and things, just to try and explore actually how loud is my voice and how quiet is my voice. Um, and how loud is my sister's voice or my brother's voice and people around me. So we'll usually just create lots of games around that and then try and use visual prompts in school to try and help that communication. But it does sound like you're not getting the right support from school, unfortunately, as well, which is quite a common scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we add in the PDA element to tell the child not to do it, we'll increase Absolutely. the compulsion to do it. Yes, yes. As well we need as them to all, understand. Yeah. yeah, as well as all the other things going on. So it's like Alan, um, Alison said, it's about really school, perhaps working with the parents, with the child, perhaps getting some outside agencies in, if, if they're not already in, you know, an ASD outreach team, and having a look at what sense support can be put in place to help the child with this aspect, rather than trying to deal with it with, by reprimand. It's... So, teaching the child, I suppose, why this isn't seen as acceptable, providing alternative ways of communicating, regulating the sensory input and so on. It's working around the child's sense rather than the presumption that the child can do it by an act of will, which is 
the presumption that's made when they're told to stop and then it's consequences when that doesn't happen. Because that may exacerbate the process. A, being it as a can't, not a won't. Yes, mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, we've just got one last question here um, relating to sort of understanding of SPD, particularly for siblings, but it might also lead into whether there's any good books um, that we can um, recommend um, for people to help understand SPD. So a broad question um, on advice for developing sibling support and understanding. My teenage son is very unsupported of my SPD, so that's sensory processing disorders, quirks and meltdowns. So any suggestions around developing understanding in siblings um, and, and others. Yes. How, how old is, it, is, is the sibling, Becky? Uh, I think it was teenage, teenage um, okay. siblings. Yeah. Don't go first, Jane. I was just going to say, watching this webinar might be quite helpful. <laughs> That's why I checked on the age of the, you know, of the child. Um, it's about education, isn't it, and how to educate depending on the age of the sibling. So this webinar, perhaps for an older sibling, um, there may be things available on the internet. You know, you can get very often on YouTube. There are short little films that help to explain different aspects of ASD, and I'm sure there's stuff on there over sensory processing. It's finding appropriate materials um, to try and educate a sibling, and sometimes that's done better if they're watching something that's coming from a third person rather than the parent directly. Alison, yeah. I've got some much better options. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> it is. I mean, often we'll, we do try and get siblings involved in sessions. Yeah. So if they're coming in for sessions, we like siblings to come as well often so they can understand and support, particularly where PDA is an issue as well, um, so that everybody's involved because it isn't a matter, as we said earlier, of just giving programmes because that doesn't work. Um, but actually experiencing some of the games and things that you find difficult. So I know we're talking teenage, but if it's a teenager that you're able to talk to and play with and do some fun out there kind of things, Things like standing on one leg and then closing your eyes and seeing how hard it is for one person compared to the other do. And, um, you know, there are sort of auditory discrimination type activities online so you can play noises and try and guess what they are. Even things like where's Wally type games. Some people with sensory processing difficulties will find those kind of things really difficult to do than others. Um, you know, closing your eyes and touching your finger to your nose. Things that just show that, that why did that happen, but also to involve them in the reflection. So when there has been an issue or something that's really stood out, it's good to sit down with them with a pen and paper and scribble some drawings and go, why do you think your brother, your sister, found that really difficult to do? What did you think about that situation? Why do you think that was a problem? It can be a really good way just to get them involved and see how things are harder for them to do. Because particularly, I guess, as well, the behavioural side of it stands out massively, doesn't it? Because like we talked about with the outbursts, you know, with a child without SPD, PDA, SD, you're going to be able to tell them off in the, in the throes of the situation, whereas often you're seen to step back and support the child riding that sort of tidal wave rather than actually disciplining them in the same way. Again, a flip chart can be really good, just taking points maybe from the webinar, the webinar today, looking at what the senses are and how they work and, you know, what textures do you feel? So thinking about what do you like to do, that they might love to go on Oblivion Ride at Alton Towers, whereas you would absolutely hate that that they might want to eat a spicy Rogan Josh, but somebody else would absolutely hate that and would want the korma. Um, you know, that we talked about somebody loving the smell of petrol, somebody hating it. So thinking around the senses and thinking what we all like and don't like to recognise our differences to start with as well can also help just feed into those discussions to understand why somebody else might find all that very difficult to do. Brilliant. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. And did we talk about any books about SPD that are helpful? I know we talked about YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. There um, are, and I'm trying to think of the ones that are good for kids. Um, I've put a couple up there, certainly for general reading for adults. The Carol Cranowitz one, The Out of Sync Child, can't recommend highly enough. I find it really useful, and there's usually lots of second-hand ones available on Amazon. Um, thinking about ones for teenagers to give, no, I can't offhand. That's my fault, but certainly can have a look into that, because I know there are um, a couple where children have written and that they can read about themselves. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think that's probably all we have time for today. So thank you very much again to Alison for um, a very informative presentation and to both of you um, for your helpful answers in the Q&A session. Thank you everyone um, who asked questions as well. Um, if there are any remaining questions, we will reply to them via email. And if anyone has any further questions, please do email our um, PDA Society inquiry line team via info at pdasociety.org.uk. 
Thank you very much for attending. We look forward to welcoming you again to our next webinar in the series, which is PDA and Educational Strategies with Phil Christie and Ruth Fidler on November the 21st. This event isn't yet live for registration, so please keep an eye on our website and social media channels um, so that you know when that is ready to accept registrations. So thank you very much for listening.